Okay, so do you remember the other day we got to yeah that we we got to that so end of that first section with the, the concentration had been on the girls in the school and then we this next section of the uh, the, the poem itself we get an insight into the, the teachers out of school um, and it, it, it's beginning to um, create different pictures. Of them. I mean, how would we describe the teachers up until now? How we how Point in the school environment, what the, how these teachers come across? Not very. They've got a lot of power. Yeah, a lot of power. What else do you think, Fiona? Um, like, we haven't really commented out about the personalities. Yeah, lacking a personality, so they, they, they kind of seem to have sort of um, stuck to sort of, you know, almost like subject specific, that sort of idea. Um, do they appear to have any empathy at all with their students? No, I mean, is that a real kind of um, division, that barrier uh, between them, uh, sort of that, that sort of, uh, yeah, you could call it that, that age gap, you know, it, it's, it's different, different generational gaps that, that you get sometimes. So, um, Look at this one here. So, Miss Dunn was the first to depart, wheeling her bicycle through the gates, noticing how the sky had clear, cleared a tiny diagram of the plough directly above her. She liked it this cold, her breath chiffoning out behind her as she freewheeled home down the hill, her mind emptying itself of geography, of mountains, of seas and deserts and forests and capital cities. Her small terrace house looked, she thought, like a sleeping face. She roused it each evening, kisses of lights in its cheek from her lamps, the small talk of cutlery, pots and pans as she cooked, sweet silver stream caressing the shy rooms of her home. Miss Dunn lived alone. Um, right, so what do we get? What, what, what sort of idea do we get about Miss Dunn from that verse? What do you, what do you think of her as a, as a person? What do we learn about her personality? Right, so is she maybe, the inference there may be about her being a little bit lonely, yeah? So, you know, that sort of speculation that we can have there, you know. Um, she lives alone. Um, is it, that, yeah, is she lonely or does she live alone through choice? Where else do we get, and again, use the text here. Where else do we get an insight into Miss Dunn's kind of personality? What suggests that she's maybe a bit more, well, there's something maybe a little bit um, joyous about her in comparison to how she is in school. Yeah, so we've got that. She liked it this school, so we're, we're finding that's about it there. Um, what do you do? If you free wheel, what are you doing? If you, you do it on a bike, don't you? You freewheel on the bike. So what do you do? It's not a trick question. Um, Have you ridden a bike? I know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you're going up a hill, what do you need to do? 
<laughs> yeah, you're not gonna you're not, you're not gonna cycle off it, yeah. Go up and walk it up. But come in down the hill, what do you need to do? Oh, if you if, if you're feeling a bit Yeah, feet off the pedal and just freewheel down. Now what do, if if you're freewheeling, what does that suggest about you personality wise? Does it suggest that you're stiff and starchy? No. What else? What, what, what will it suggest then? Yeah, what, what's that image? Uh, it's, a, it's a rather kind of joyous image, isn't it, that we have here? Oops. Um. Yeah, I mean, you know, for here we can think about it in context. It's we can think of it in these sort of ways, almost like a, you know, like a, a, a rule breaker. She, she's far more liberated. Um, she, she's just enjoying the simple things in life. And again, we've got it mentioned earlier on as well in the same sort of uh, verse there. You know, when she's going home, she's wheeling her bicycle through the gates. You know, and again, it's, you know, you think about it. You know, the movement of a bike—it's you know, it's going to be smooth. You know, isn't it a circular thing? Um, and it, it isn't a, now. It's now when she's out of school, she notices things, doesn't she? Um, sorry. It's that she becomes yeah she becomes childlike again herself, isn't it? That's it exactly, Nadine. Good, yeah. She's noticing all the nice things, but you know it's the stars and the sky, the coldness, free wheeling. It's great. No, nothing to sort of um, how do we call her? No, nothing to bother with. Nothing to trouble with her. She doesn't have to worry about her her geography knowledge or her lesson for the next year and that. She's just been able to enjoy. Yeah, good. Yeah, you see, with that sort of uh, noticing th noticing things around her, yeah, it, it, it's that idea that she, you know, that the school kids herself, now uh, she notices it. Um, and everything about her is really kind of soft and gentle. Um, we've got the, a breath, it's, and again, another really nice, beautiful image, chiffoning out behind as she freewheeled. Now, chiffon is a type of material. What is it? Do you know? You don't. Shall I show you? <laughs> Sheep on us. Um, hang on. Come on, why don't you move? Right, just move off the this one there. Ah, that's a good one. Right. So, as you can see, chiffon. Um, as material. If it decides to come up. Yeah. Um, so it's really that sort of light, delicate material, um, very sheer, delicate, um, that, that as well. Um, soft in the skin, that sort of idea. Okay, so if we go back, whoop, 
to hear. Um, you know, and again, you think you think about your breath in those sort of cold winter's days, you know, and it just goes out, and obviously she's in the bike, so it's just sort of coming out. It's that sort of mist-like quality to the breath. It's thin, it's gentle. Yeah. Um, and again, it, it's with. Um, I'm going to get that stump back in just now. You know where it's going to. But that sort of chiffon material, so you, you quite often you refer to it as being diaphanous, which is to get that sort of sense of it being so so um, thin, uh, and it, it, it's almost kind of let's like see through with chiffon material. Yeah, you you got that, and so it gives that sort of delicate delicateness of of the breath then that's seen in the air. Yeah, and so that, that that's the sort of two, you know, the, the two connections that are getting made there, that that's equally. But as I say, it's, it's a lovely, so, and we've got loads of sort of um, lovely images here. Um, so we've got that, and, and when our mind begins to empty itself of geography, of mountains and seas and deserts and capital cities, what else is her mind becoming emptied of? Yeah, that's it, isn't it? You know, the cares, the worries of work, that sort of thing, all going, um, got disappearing. And then we have a small terrace house, which looks like a sleeping face. And again, it is that, that beauty and, and, and gentleness uh, of the image here. Um, how would the house look like a sleeping face? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to do one of my fantastic, this is one of my first, and you, you might have seen a big copy of my artwork from me in the other days, you know, truly astounding my artwork. So you, you'll be amazed by this, Nadine. So, yeah, if we think of our little house, yeah, terrace house, and that's there. There's our, here's our door, it's a bit of a roof, which can double as a hat. Um, but yeah, if you think of yeah, and the windows, and again, if you imagine them, you know, sort of blinds pulled down, isn't it? That's I think it's in the darkness in the window. Hence, you know, that's why it's sleeping. And, and again, it's roused by the lights going on. As you can see, I didn't do my GCSE. You know? <laughs> but it's, it's that idea, isn't it? And again. It's about personification, it's about the house kind of representing her as well. And and again, when you think of a sleeping face, isn't it? That's a face that normally is calm, at ease with the world, not a, not a worry, not a care, not a concern. And, that, you know, again, think of little children, you know, little babies when they're sleeping, you know, as you know, I see. Karen just went, mm. yeah, it's that, it's that sort of really heartwarming image, isn't it, that we all have, and it's, a, it's that gentleness to it. And again, isn't there's just this emotion coming into Miss Dunn now, isn't there? Um, you know, she rouses it each evening with kisses of light in its cheek from her lamps. You know, wonderful. Now, so she rouses it and um, the kisses of light, and then we've got the small talk of cutlery, pots and pans as she cooked, um, sweet silver steam caressing the shy rooms of her house. What's been done to this house? What technique does Duffy use here with the house? So I say that again, Fiona? No, it's not listing. If, if, we're getting, if we're getting small talk from the cutlery. Yeah. Oops. 
You know, isn't it? the house is just personified. We've got everything here. You know, it's got a sleeping face. Um, oops. Um, so th this has, you know, it, it's personified and everything about it is brought to life by Miss Dunn, but it reflects Miss Dunn too, isn't it? It's her personality. Um, you know, that idea, if you, if you rouse somebody, again, it's, it's, it's a gentle way of doing something. You know, it's not like you're roughly shaking somebody away, you know, get up, get up, get up, that sort of thing. Everything about this is soft and gentle now, which again is coming across as like how Miss Dunn appears. But we're only getting to find out about this once she leaves the school, you know, once she's got away from that sort of place of work. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, and again, everything, you, gentleness, you know, the silver, uh, the silver steam, which is, whoops, um, described here as caressing the shy rooms of the, the house. So, I mean, again, it's more that we find out about, about Miss Dunn as well, you know, we can tell Miss Dunn herself is a shy personality, and we see that when she's within, you know, with her fellow teachers in school, you know, that her, her, her um, sort of, uh, her, her personality, her character disappears and she puts on this sort of mantle of being a teacher. She is just the teacher, Miss Dunn sort of thing. Um, and so they are really soft, gentle image. And, and this carries on again. Um, when we go into the next class, we find out about, um, so did Miss Bat in a flat on the edge of the park near the school. Though this evening Miss Fife was coming for supper, the two were good friends, and Miss Fife liked to play a piano, uh, to play Miss Bat's small piano after the meal, and the slowly shared carafe of wine, music, and maths. Johann Sebastian Bach, Miss Bat, an all rounder, took out her marking, essays on Henry the, the Eighth and his wife's from the Fifth, while Miss Fife gave herself up to minuet and G. Um, and so we're seeing connections. Um, between uh, teachers as well, between between women, um, and it's this idea we get more and more kind of you know insight into them about different interests that they have. Um, you know, Miss Five playing on on, on uh, Miss Bat's piano while uh, Miss Bat is just doing her, her marking of her essays, um, and it, it's this is this idea that they find happiness, don't they? Again away from the school it's not what they've, 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 they've you know in that sort of strange sterile environment of the school none of this appears it's again it's it's only away from it that you know as humans they kind of flourish and it's that you know i suppose it's a bit like um it's always interesting when pupils meet their teachers out of school you know especially for the first few times when that happens you know it's like you know people sometimes amazed to learn that teachers actually do go shopping and and they, and they, they go to supermarkets and buy food and you know basic things you know it's that sort of thing but isn't it it's that that kind of strange revelation you know, <laughs> that, that they are just like normal human beings too um and, and so this one, it carries on. So we've got um, in between Catherine Howard and Catherine Parr, Miss Bat uh, glanced across at Fifi's straight back uh, as she played each teacher conscious of each woman's silently virtuous love. Nights like this, twice a week after school for them both, seemed enough. Um, so what have we got here then? That reference to um, silently virtuous love, who are they in love with? They're in love with each other, aren't they? Yeah.
So, you know, it's that idea, because it's, isn't it, it said that it's silently virtuous love. It's not an openly declared love. Why not? What What's Duffy sort of driving at here, do you think? Again, think of the time scale. We're looking at sort of late 1950s. Yeah, it's not, basically it's not accepted and it's not even legal, yeah, uh, then it, it's because of, of what their relationship is, you know, it can be. And so again, we can see, it begins to explain maybe some of the, 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 the behaviour of these teachers in school, because here again, it's just like, the, it's just like the, the students with the repressed laughter, you know, the more you try to, you know, stop it from happening the more pressure builds up for it just to explode. And so it, it's then sort of showing the sort of things that are being repressed, kept beneath the surface within within the adult as well, that sort of thing. But again, all to do with the female gender, female identity here um, that's being explored. Um, and again, it, it, it's just it, it'd be deemed illegal, um, it wouldn't be accepted, but it still finds a way out, just like the laughter. Um, and, and so maybe beginning to, Duffy beginning to sort of try and portray here as well, isn't it, that um, maybe teachers and their, their students aren't so, so different after all um, when, when she's exploring these sorts of ideas. Um, and it's that, you know, and again, just a nice little sort of subtle things. I mean, it's obviously Miss um, Bat's name for Miss Fife, you know, that, that, that sort of nickname, that use of Fifi, you know, it, it, it's, it's playful, it's provocative, all of those sorts of ideas. And it's about, you know, two people at ease in each other's company. Yeah. Um, both conscious of how they feel, and, you know, each con teach, teacher conscious of each woman's silent, virtuous love. Um, and it, it, it's quite nice, wasn't it, that it, they refer to, first of all, as each teacher. So that's their kind of professional capacity, that the professional role. And then in the next line, they become each woman more of that individual, isn't it? It's more of that personality, who they are. Yeah. Um, and so we come across Miss Mackay next, um, often gave Miss, oh, I can never pronounce this one, Miss Nad Dimbaba a lift, as they both by coincidence lived in Mulberry Drive. Miss Mackay with her husband of 25 grinding childless years. Miss Nad Dimbaba sharing a house with her elderly aunt. Neither had ever invited the other one in, although each would politely inquire after her colleague's invisible half. Mrs. Mackay watched Mrs. Nandimbaba open her purple door and saw a cat rubbing itself on her calf. She pulled away from the cab, worrying whether Mr. Mackay would insist on fish for his meal. Then he would do his crossword, Mr. Mackay calling out clues. King of court for a bounder, uh, or kind of court for a bounder, eight letters, or eight, while she passed him Roger's brewer pairs and the OED. Now, interestingly, interesting, don't we, we have the first one, what we we have the first kind of couple. We've got the first Mrs. Mrs. Mackay, and she's been married for twenty-five grinding, childless years. Does Mrs. Mackay sound happy? No, she's counted every one of those twenty-five years, hasn't she? Oh, it's not been good. But again, isn't it? And it, 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 it hints at something that she longs for. You know, the fact that it's revenue of those childless years, maybe the suggestion of that's why she's a teacher to be near. 
children, that sort of idea, you know, it's sort of making a sort of a recompense for it. Um, and where we've seen, you know, in the previous verse there, obviously we've got, we've got teach, you know, Miss Bat and Miss Fife, you know, they've got some sort of um, life outside of school, you know, they've got something that they have together, they've got, a, you know, a, a relationship whatsoever. Here is this one that somebody whose life kind of outside of school is offering no release, just you know, other but others are having a release from school, you know, once they come out. Mrs. Mackay doesn't, Mrs. Uh, Madam Bamba isn't either, you know, in their own way, they're both kind of carers for, the, for their other halves here, aren't they? And it's this sort of a idea about, you know, that, that their lives aren't fulfilled. Um, the women teachers of England slept in their beds. They're shrewd or wise or sensible heads, safe vessels for Othello's jealousy, the wife of Bath's warm laugh, the phrase, the faces of the moon, the country code for Roman numerals, Greek alphabets, French verbs for foreign currencies and Latin roots for logarithms, tables, quotes, the meaning of, of current, calamo, and fiat lux instead. Miss Dunn dreamed of a freezing white terrain which slowly, where slowly moving elephants were made of ice. Uh, Miss Nadam Baba dre dreamed she knelt to kiss Miss Barrett on her couch, and she, Miss Nadam Baba, was browning, saying, Beloved, be my wife. And then a dog began to bark, and she woke up. Miss Barrett dreamed of Miss Fife. Um, what's going on there then in that verse, do you think? Sorry, say that again for you. Yeah, isn't it? It's there. Whoops. Whoops. Um, it's these sort of the, it's their hopes, their dreams, their fantasies. And it's all of these things that it's, it's repressed, it's controlled during their, their day, during their role as a teacher, everything that they're having to do. But, you know, at night, you know, the, the subconscious kicks in and suddenly and suddenly, you know, the, 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 their true self appears, what they want to be. And we see all these different aspects to them. Um, Yeah. And so we've had this little insight, you know, in, in this episode. So down to here, um, and again with it, with the sort of um, obviously the that sort of breaking up again, it moves back to school. You know, it's almost we have this sort of snapshot of some of the teachers um, and their home life uh, and all of what's going on in their, their world outside of school. Um, I mean, again, it's one of these things, isn't it, as well? Sometimes, it, isn't it? <laughs> I suppose it's the same for any profession, but sometimes it seems more so for, for, for teachers. Isn't it? It's this idea that teachers actually have lives outside of school as well. They've got other things going on in their life yet within the school. In a way that that's always kind of got to be permanently hidden. Um, it's that idea that you know you, you're there, almost sort of you know playing out a role as a teacher, um, and that that sort of day to day basis. And then now it's sort of kick, kicking around in your in, in your life. It's kind of got to be left at the school gates, sort of thing, until you go back out again at the end of a day. Um, that we all do that, and so we've seen this sort of interlude of them as them being sort of 
just normal human beings like the rest of us, you know, it's about their hopes, their dreams, all that sort of thing, their, their relationships, their loves, their desires, everything. And then we flip back into school again the next day. And so, and again, it shows this contrast when we come back into the, um, the school, they become these different people again. Um, all that sort of tenderness, softness, gentleness, everything gone, and they, and, and they go into this sort of um, role of being a teacher. So we have morning assembly. The world like quink outside. Uh, the teachers perched in a solemn row on the stage, the fifth and sixth forms clever and tall. Miss Fife at the school piano, the head herself, Dr. Bream at the stand was a serious affair. Jerusalem hung in the air to the last of Miss Fife's big chords wobbled away. Yesterday, intoned Dr. Bream, the lower school behaved in a foolish way, sniggering for most of the late afternoon. And she glared at the girls through the, her pins nez and paused for dramatic effect. But the first and second and third and fourth forms started to laugh, each girl trying to swallow it down till the sound was like distant thunder, the opening chord of a storm. Um, so again, we have we have some of these sort of um, descriptions of them uh, showing about how sort of a uh, remote, detached they are, and there's a sort of lack of understanding between the, the two groups. Um, We've got the head herself there, Dr. Bremen again, you know, it gives that idea of you know, being a doctor, it gives status hierarchy, isn't it, within it. Um, and it's the fact that using phrases like she intoned, you know, it's that idea, isn't it, or it's, it's like a teacher delivering a sermon, isn't it, you know, this is a message. You know, you always know when when you get one of those special assemblies, don't you, from the stage, from the front of the school, there's a kind of special voice that the head teacher or the deputy head or whatever they will use when they want to get across this particular message. And it does almost become sermon-like, they become like preachers, that sort of idea. Um, and we, we, we tend to use that sort of that sort of phrase um, in tone. Oops, but too big there. Hey. Yeah, better. Um, oh, going too small now. Get it right, yeah. Yeah, that's better. Um, it does suggest it's got that kind of religious overtone. Um, we do kind of think of that, so, you know. We often quite talk about like, a priest intoning at mass, sort of thing, and so it's delivering that sort of a, that that sound uh, to it as well. Okay. Oops. Um, and then as well as well as this, she's glared at the girls, and so we see that sense, don't we, um, of defiance of a barrier between the older generation and the younger generation. Uh, the two don't meet, and, and it's trying, and again, it, it's trying to use that power and status to make the younger generation come to heel, isn't it? Yeah. Your classic teacher stare, which sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Any teachers that you didn't like to um, get the glare from in your in your earlier school days? Yeah. 
most schools used to always have, used to always have to have somebody in the teaching staff who was the one who would put the fear of God into kids. You know, right? You got to got to be like the big guns. There's got there had to be one who they wouldn't want to kind of have to stare down. Yeah, yeah, got to have one of them. Uh, now, do, do you know? Do you know what a pins knee is? You know those glasses you get, well, not glasses, where it's just two lenses and you just pop it onto the nose. There's no legs, yeah. And it's just a couple of bands. That's what the pince nez is, and so it's creating this very kind of um, stereotypical caricature of her. You know, she's a doctor. You know, that's a high academic thing, and to have these little glasses, and it'd always be sort of perched in the bridge of your nose, so the half, the kind of half on, half off. That sort of thing, and most often, most often they peer over. Um, so it's all being done for effect, um, and of course, it has the completely wrong impact. Um, you know, trying to return to it the next day, and um, because the girls just start again and again, it's like the sound of distant thunder, the opening chord of a storm. Um, Miss Dunn, Miss Bat, Miss Nadim Baba, and Mrs. Mackay leapt to their feet uh, as one grim faced. Now, think about it, you know, think how they have changed from the previous night, yeah? Um, and so, you know, now they, they, they become back in school, they, they become grim faced. It's that idea, you know, is this isn't it the got I mean it's an automatic response, you know, because of this sort of you know, they see it as defined for the youngsters, you know, that that this sort of um not taking things seriously. It, it, it's this idea that, the, you know, the, the automatic, the shutters go up, they become grim face, and it's this sort of stern um, character that they have to project. Yeah. It's about holding the line here. Yeah. Um, and then we get more of that, you know, more of that sort of animal ideas, you know, the fifth form, hooted and howled, it's, it's an echo of earlier in this poem, isn't it? Miss Fife, oddly disturbed, crashed down fistful of furious notes on the yellowing keys. Um, the six forms, up, the six forms of upper and lower shrieked, Senora devises, sartorial, strict, slim, severe, teacher of Spanish, stalked from the stage and stilettoed sharply down to the back of the hall to, ch to chastise the fifth and sixth form. Um, now, um, we have, yeah, no, wait, sartorial, strict, slim, severe, and she stalked uh, and her stilettoed heels. What does Senora um, Davis sound like? Yes, yeah, lots of sharp S sounds, isn't it? Oops.
You know, and that idea of stalked as well, it makes her sound predatory, isn't it? You know, it's as if she's some sort of caged animal about to be unleashed on, on, on these students. Did you do Spanish, um, Fionn? No, he didn't. Well, you do Spanish, Dean? What does chaos mean, do you know? Cadenz, I think you find out about that. Um, the whole school guffawed, their pink young lungs flowering more than they had uh, for the hymn, El Clamor. The hall was a zoo. And again, we have that, isn't it? I mean, but again, it's who, you know, who are the animals and who, who, who are the kind of onlookers here sort of thing. Um, snow began falling, out, falling outside as though the clouds were being slowly turned up like a rule book. Um, and again, it's, it's that sort of soundscape that we've got um, earlier in this verse. Say it was, it was held. You know, and again, we've got all that, you know, it kicked off with the sound of, the, you know, the thunder of a distant storm, I think. But we've had the howled and the hooted, you know, we've got the crashing of the notes from the piano, the stalking Senora devices. And so it does really fit in with this idea of being a zoo, a menagerie, and it's it's just chaotic, this scene, you know. And, and again, it's this sense of all control being lost here um, with the teachers, those that are meant to be in charge, losing it, losing it, and everything, um, due to the laughter um, and nice imagery going on again with the snow fa falling outside and again it's like um, it says slowly turn up like a rule book and that isn't it it's like you know how that's what children do don't they they get the bits of paper and they tear them up you know look for the confetti chucking it in the air that sort of thing and and that's the analogy that's been getting made um to to the um the school children's behavior here um a good laugh as the poet Ursula Fleur, who attended the school, was to famously write as feasting on air. The air that day was chomped, chewed, bitten in two, pulled apart like a wishbone, licked like a lollipop, sluiced and sucked. Some of the girls were almost sick. Girls gulped or sipped or slopped as they savoured the joke. What joke. Um, and again, more kind of classic, classic um, Duffy techniques there, you know. And again, it, it ties in with that image of the zoo, the air that day, it was chomped, it was chewed, bitten in two, uh, chomped and chewed, onomatopoeic, and it, it's just given that idea of a, of a frenzy taking place in the hall, isn't it? Um, and and the, the lollipop being sluiced and sucked, all of those sort of, um, it's sensory image going on here, um, and lots of sort of, auditory words being used by Duffy to create the atmosphere. Um, and so we've got that going on with, with, with the behaviour here. Um, and, and, but it's almost again about everything coming to a head. Uh, and that's a pressure pot cooking. Okay, so uh, now I think that's got us to the end of that first section. Yeah, brilliant. And we'll pick up next on that second one, yeah, which I've set up for the next lesson. So it seems a good point to stop as it comes to three o'clock. Two timing is everything. Um, so that's just got to the end of that. that just down at the foot of page forty-one here. Um, and again, hopefully, you know, 
still, I think, you know, what is a really sort of joyous poem? It, it's one that, you know, it, I, you get some sort of pleasure reading as it, as it just sort of gives you these sort of vignettes of school life and of, of, of behaviour. And, and it seems to be like that, you know, that sort of eternal battle between teachers and, and, and students. And with this section over here, I get this sort of kind of mental image of St Trinians almost, you know, the behaviour of the teachers and the girls, you know, these stern teachers trying to control. Now, girls, girls, behave yourself, behave yourself. And the more they do that, it just gets more and more out of control. And it just, you know, it's got to let it run its course. Um, but, you know, yeah, a real... Real joy in comparison to reading about things about, you know, dieting and shopaholics and other such things, yeah. Okay, so there we shall leave it for today. Okay, just finish the uh, recording bit now. And that will be that. Boom. I forgot to do a stop recording.